Hi, I'm Abby, I have a lot of records, and this was supposed to be a 40-minute video. So welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. If 30 minute, or in this week's case probably 40 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds, both here on my channel and over on my Instagram. Before we get into this week's video, I have a couple announcements to make. First, if you dear viewer clicked on a Pink Floyd video, then you probably have at least a fleeting interest in prog rock. For all you prog heads, Naomi of 365 Days of Prog invited me onto the channel. It was this great big project ranking all of Roger Dean's artwork, and I got to talk about this artwork, Fragile by Yes. 365 Days of Prague is a wonderful channel. Thank you so much, Naomi, for inviting me on, and that Roger Dean video will be linked in my description. Secondly, for all of you general classic rock fans, I will be on the Hang Fire podcast a week from today, October 2nd at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Justin and I will be talking all things classic Rolling Stones, maybe a little older, maybe a little newer. You can catch that live on the Hang Fire channel. The channel will be linked in my description. If you subscribe and click the bell, then you'll be notified when we go live next Monday. So today's album was supposed to be the season three premiere, actually. I was supposed to kick off this current season of Vinyl Monday with this album, but the 30th anniversary of a Nirvana album kind of took priority. This week's album is... The Wall by Pink Floyd. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, all you got to do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what next week's album is going to be. I host polls over there sometimes, and I drop little reminders and updates on other projects I do that aren't on this channel, like podcasts and Now Dig This and all that good stuff. All right, let's take the plastic off. So my copy is an early repress, and it's kind of an odd one. Rick Wright's name is in the credits on the gatefold of this album that you will very soon see. B-Roll Abbey will be showing you all of this. But the inserts are where things start to get weird. The original copies, as well as some early represses like mine, still have the lyrics to What Shall We Do Now, and some songs in the wrong order. These copies really aren't too hard to come by. Pre-orders in droves meant that all of the people who bought The Wall when it first came out have this packaging situation. More on that later. The Wall marks Pink Floyd's first piece of cover art since A Saucer Full of Secrets in 1968, not designed by at least one member of Hypnosis. This art was designed by Gerald Scarf. He designed the puppets for The Wall tour and animated for The Wall film. His art is integral to the whole of The Wall, really. The cover I have is just, well, the wall. The logo was a sticker on the shrink wrap, which I clearly do not have. Opening up the gatefold, the intended front cover and gatefold situations were reversed as Roger preferred the more minimalist thing. See him wearing exclusively black t-shirts for the last 50 years. The Wall also marks the last record of the classic era of Pink Floyd. We have Roger Waters on vocals, bass, synths, and serving as Prince principal songwriter, David Gilmore on guitar, synths, and vocals, Rick Wright on piano, keys, and mini Moog synth. Yes, contrary to popular belief, Rick Wright is playing on the wall, but he only gets one feature through this album's entire 80 minutes. More on that later. And we have Nick Mason on drums and various percussion. Special guests include, but are not limited to, the performers of the New York Opera, the New York Orchestra, and the Islington Group 
Green School Children's Choir. These orchestral arrangements were written by Michael Kamen. An unknown telephone operator appears on Young Lust, Chris Fitzmorris plays Pink's wife's lover, and Trudy Young voices the groupie. As for featured vocalists, Ms. Great Gig in the Sky herself, Claire Torrey comes back for vocals on The Trial, and Bruce Johnston of the Beach Boys, of all people, does some backing vocals too. The Wall was produced by Bob Ezrin and James Guthrie with Roger Waters and David Gilmore. Roll transition. <laughs> Okay, so, the drama surrounding the wall is almost as theatrical as the wall itself, so buckle the f*** up. Our story starts on July 6th, 1977, while touring for the Animals album cycle, you know, the Pink Floyd album I don't like, they have a particularly bad night at Olympic Stadium in Montreal. We all know how the night ended with... Roger spitting on a group of hecklers, and David storming off stage to watch the encore from the sound booth. But why did this happen? By the time Animals rolled around, Pink Floyd were one of the biggest touring acts of the 70s, second only to Led Zeppelin. So they played these stadium shows to meet the demand. The thing about a stadium show is you have people showing up hours early, giving them plenty of time to drink or get high or generally not give a f about the show. Roger hated this. He wanted the fans to experience the music, not treat it as one great big frat party. Your front man being in a terrible mood to begin with, plus a bunch of drunk assholes waiting around hours for the show to start, plus no opening act to keep the drunk assholes busy? That is a recipe for disaster. Roger was so pissed off and defeated, he wanted to physically build a wall between himself and the audience. This was the night the wall was born. The Wall is our main character, Pink, little reference to wish you were here, there, telling us the story of his life so far. The character of Pink is part Roger Waters, part Sid Barrett, that's where he gets his obligatory Hendrix poem from. And am I the only one who thinks there's a little bit of David Bowie in there? He did kind of lose his marbles after the whole Ziggy Stardust thing. And he did have that space cadet glow. This is the story of the wall that we're told through the music. <laughs> We open the record with Pink's father dying in World War II before he was born. Pink's mother, voiced by David, vows to protect little Pink. Maybe a little too much. Looking at photos of the father he never knew, Pink has his first big feeling, his first brick in the wall. We time skip to his school years, where a school teacher verbally and physically abuses Pink and his fellow students. Pink's mother shepherds him through his young adult years as he starts writing songs and eventually gets married. Mother screws up Pink so badly that it builds the wall even higher. Side 2 opens with a flashback of Pink's mother raising him in the immediate aftermath of World War II, I think? This is one of the lesser clear points in the narrative. With another time skip, Pink becomes a famous rock star and lives the rock and roll life, life on the road surrounded by groupies. One night, Pink calls his wife back home only for a man to pick up. Pink's been off touring and sleeping with groupies, and his wife has been cheating on him the entire time. This is Pink's final straw. He has a breakdown, trashes his hotel room, calls his wife back home drunk or high, and the first disc closes with Pink vowing never to trust anybody ever again. The second disc opens with Pink immediately regretting this decision, but it's too late, the wall has been built too high. He's isolated himself after his penthouse breakdown physically and mentally. He gets high, fantasizes about the war or something, and finds a temporary escape from his pain through drugs. On side four, we find out Pink's repose doesn't last long. His manager drags him out to play another show, but this one's different. Pink provokes the audience into violence. This part is a lot 
less clear as he's had like a full psychotic break at this point, but it appears he's hallucinating being a fascist leader as he sits in jail for inciting the riot. He's jailed in his own mind too, where there's this batch crazy uber theatrical trial. Finally, Pink realizes the only way to free himself of his trauma is to tear down the wall. Roger played these two demos, Bricks in the Wall and Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking, for the rest of Floyd, and they all greenlit the wall. Now, one of the benefits of the Wall Project was that the initial plot was pretty much written. The original plot, though, was a lot more autobiographical. He edit it to make it a little less of a trauma dump at the behest of Bob Ezrin. This edited plot is the summary I just gave you. But the main drawback was, well, the album was pretty much written. None of the other guys knew how they would fit into this puzzle, if at all. This was very much Roger's project and there wasn't much room for collaboration. Production begins at Britannia Row. Britannia, Britannia rules the... <laughs> In the summer of 78, by now Raj has met Gerald Scarf and they begin their years-long working relationship through the whole wall shebang. But whoops, uh-oh, Norton Warburg has mishandled Floyd's investments and now they're three million dollars in debt! The idea was for Norton Warburg to take all of Floyd's royalties pre-taxes and put that money into, like, hotels, restaurants, home entertainment, and the like. Having their money in all of these investments meant that Floyd wouldn't have to pay the 83% income tax. This isn't as bad as the 90-something percent tax that the Beatles were paying in 66, but it's still pretty high. One of Floyd's accountants realizes that Norton Warburg is taking these huge commission fees, way bigger than they should have. So much so that Floyd lost all of the money they made on Dark Side of the Moon. It can't get much worse than this, right? Right? Wrong! Turns out Norton Warburg was borrowing from Floyd's investments to keep the failing venture capitals afloat. They embezzled so hard that Floyd now owed the British government somewhere between five and twelve million dollars! This grade A sh show was soon dubbed the Great Ripoff, and it meant that the wall went from Roger's passion project into the only thing that could possibly pay Pink Floyd's massive bill. So what do you do when you're rock stars and you owe a sh ton of money to the British government? That's right, you pull a Rolling Stones and you flee to France. They weren't just booking it to France for no reason, though. David and Rick recorded their first solo albums at Super Bear Studio in Nice. On their past three records, Floyd were credited as producers with help from their audio engineers, of course. But the wall was different. Raj wanted it to be a multimedia experience. Bob Ezrin is brought on as producer to help execute this thing, keep it on the rails as best he can. Bob has said in the past that the greatest mind he ever worked with was Roger Waters. He's also said that the most difficult person he's ever worked with was Roger Waters. Why? Well, this is the part of the story where it gets hard to sympathize with Roger. His reputation for being a grade A asshole begins with the production of The Wall. The crux of all of this being two big issues, recording in France and producer credits. Roger told David he'd be given a producer credit for his contributions, but Rick and Nick would not. Thus begins the long tradition of Roger Waters devaluing the contributions of the rest of Pink Floyd. Nick didn't give a fuck about this. He recorded all of his parts early in the process and got the hell out of Dodge as soon as Horseman Roger started chomping on his bit. But Rick took this very personally. The whole of Floyd had been credited as producers on their records as far back as Umma Gumma. The spirit had always been about collaboration. Why should the wall be any different? 
Rick asks to be a producer on the record, but Roger says no on the grounds of him contributing less and less during sessions and procrastinating recording his parts. Rick was having a really hard time. He was going through a divorce and his kids had to stay in England to go to school. He is what we might now call severely depressed. Bob Ezrin asked Rick to stop coming to sessions if he wasn't gonna do anything. So Rick would sneak into the studio in the middle of the night to record his parts when Raj and his new right-hand man Bob weren't gonna be there. It all culminates with Columbia calling up Floyd and telling them they'd get a bigger cut of the profits if they could deliver the wall by the 1979 holiday season. Roger unceremoniously tells the guys they'll be moving production to Miraval Studio, keeping the band in France for longer, and cutting their summer break short. Rick flips his shit. This week was supposed to be the week he finally saw his kids again. Roger flips his shit right back. They were running behind, and it was because of Rick. Raj issues an ultimatum. Either I release The Wall as a solo album, or you leave Pink Floyd. David's like, hold the fucking phone. You're gonna punish the rest of us by releasing The Wall as a solo record? But he realizes that because of the Norton Warburg saga, Floyd literally can't afford to lose The Wall. Whether Rick was fired or bullied into quitting is... Well, it's all the same, really. On one hand, I do get why Roger had to put his foot down. They had a hard deadline from Columbia. Get the wall out for the holidays. Everyone is busting their asses to get this thing out, and Raj literally did not have the time to shepherd Rick through this. But on the other hand, what the fuck? Please, Roger, don't do this. I have a family to feed. F you! My dad died and I'm making it everyone's problem! After spending the summer working in France, Floyd heads out to LA to finish the wall. They hand it in to Columbia and they're like, Um, excuse me, what the f is this? We wanted a single LP full of radio hits and you're giving us 30 songs about some fictional rock star's trauma dump? The first problem at hand, it was too long to fit on two discs. The solution was to shorten in the flesh and the thin ice, move some songs around, and cut what shall we do now. But this created the second problem. All of the packaging had already been ordered, so now we have thousands upon thousands of pre-orders with the wrong track listing and lyrics to a song that just doesn't exist on here. And Columbia just kind of goes, oh well, nothing we can do about that now. The track listing of the wall goes as follows. <laughs> Opening up side one, we have In the Flesh, followed by The Thin Ice. Then, Another Brick in the Wall, part one. Next, The Happiest Days of Our Lives. Then, Another Brick in the Wall, part two. And side one closes with Mother. Opening up side two, we have Goodbye Blue Sky, followed by Empty Spaces. Then, Young Lust, followed by One of My Turns, then Don't Leave Me Now. Next, Another Brick in the Wall, Part 3, and Disc 1 closes with Goodbye, Cruel World. Opening up Disc 2, we have Is There Anybody Out There, followed by Nobody Home. Then Vera, next Bring the Boys Back Home, and Side 3 closes with Comfortably Numb. Opening up Side 4, we have The Show Must Go On, followed by the In the Flesh Reprise. Next, Run Like Hell, then Waiting for the Worms, then Stop. Next, The Trial, and the album closes with Outside the Wall. The Wall was released on November 30th, 1979, just in time for the holiday season, as promised. Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 is released as the promo single and becomes a surprise number one hit. Not even Money on Dark Side could do that. That stalled at number three. Run Like Hell and Comfortably Numb are released as singles too. 
Though Empty Spaces and Young Lust didn't get the singles treatment, Rock Radio still plays these two together to this day. I won't be going into exhaustive detail on the wall tour and movie like I did with the album, this is Vinyl Monday after all, but for the sake of fleshing out the history for you, I'll cover them briefly. The tour for this thing was a money pit. Why? For one, the guys loved pyrotechnics. Reason number two, Roger had some crazy ideas for the set design. I'm talking people in rubber masks, giant inflatable puppets, the signature Floyd circular screen, flying a plane through the auditorium, building a whole ass wall on stage crazy. All of this would have been fine had it not been for reason number three. Floyd refused to play stadiums. They filled up their venues, sure, but they simply could not sell enough tickets to offset the cost of this set. Shout out to David for directing the lighting himself. He memorized a six foot long cue sheet to run this thing. And we can't forget Roger's diva antics. He fired the lighting director literally the night before tour started. As for the film, it is a constant power struggle between Roger and Gerald Scarf, who'd been working together for years and had the plot of the wall set in stone at this point, and director Alan Parker, who was a real filmmaker and actually knew what he was doing. Hey You and The Show Must Go On didn't make the cut for the wall film, but when the tigers broke free and what shall we do now did. I like the film. I don't love it. I just like it. Had the guys had a little more time to iron out the plot and exactly how the animation would be integrated into the live action sequences, it could have been a cinematic masterpiece. I'm willing to revisit the wall film at a later date. I know the 25,000 subscriber incentive is a yellow submarine film review, so I really want to do something a little lighter, like Yellow Submarine, before I go wading back into the wall. Riddle me this, Roger. Why hasn't there been a West End slash Broadway adaptation of The Wall? I understand it's murder trying to find stage actors who can also play instruments, and you'd no doubt need an alternate to sing for Pink a couple nights a week, uh, but this story translates to the stage so well. There's plenty of music to work from, the set practically builds itself, no pun intended. I have a plot for a reworked wall in mind and everything. <laughs> Roger wrote a lot of material for the wall. That became the follow-up, the final cut. I don't see this as much of a Pink Floyd album as I do a Roger Waters solo album with the Pink Floyd name slapped onto it, yes, even more than The Wall. This at least has some musical direction from David. But Abby, whatever happened to that other demo Roger wrote? The one that wasn't Bricks in the Wall. That became Roger's 1984 solo record, The Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking, featuring Eric Clapton. All of classic rock is three degrees of Eric Clapton. If doing this for three seasons has taught me anything, it's that he's involved in literally everything. All of this considered, what do I think of this absolute beast of a record? What do I think of The Wall? <laughs> So this is a metric f ton of material, 26 songs across two discs. There's simply no way in this universe we are going to do a track by track breakdown of this thing. There's just too much happening. Instead, I'll be doing more of a, a general breakdown of the... I have a fantastic opportunity for a pun here. We're just gonna be breaking down the fundamental bricks that make the wall and why I enjoy it. Going in, every Floyd fan has a wall phase. I hit mine pretty hard in college. First things first, 
you have to really be in the mood for the wall to listen to the wall. I don't always go in intending to listen to the whole thing, but then it just kind of happens. To begin with the plot, as attached as it may seem to Roger's life, it's a very human story, e even if you're not a rock star. I deliberately haven't mentioned this until now. We came in at the beginning of In the Flesh, and isn't this where, at the end of Outside the Wall, isn't this where we came in? Even though Pink faced his fears and tore down his wall, the story isn't over. There are countless Pinks, rock stars and regular people alike who have built up their walls. This story goes on forever. It's especially pertinent to men. Roger accidentally wrote the story of a patriarchal society isolating men, expecting them to bottle up their feelings. This breeds a misplaced resentment, not for the establishment that uh, caused this, the institution as a whole, but for the individual or for the other. That's how the worms, the seed of hate, is planted, and that's how you get, in Pink's very extreme case, a rock star becoming a full-blown fascist. <laughs> When Roger really shines as a writer is when he gives these characters such fleshed out personalities, uh, save for Pink's wife, but that makes sense because Pink only really sees his wife as an extension of himself. I love how Pink adopts and flips his mother's ooh babe motif and works it into don't leave me now. This is a clever representation of Pink inheriting his controlling nature from his mother mother. Guests fill out the minor characters like the groupie, Pink's wife's lover, and that one guy in the trial who goes, God, judge, shit on him! If there ever is a stage adaptation of The Wall, that is all I want to do. Do not cast me in any principal role. I just want to walk on stage with the jury, shout, go on judge shit on him, and walk right off. It's also super cool that they used a real phone operator on Young Lust. I guess it took a few tries to get the reaction they were looking for, though. Some lesser plot points are revealed through just the music of the wall. Pink's dad, for sure, dying before Pink was born, for example. This moment in In the Flesh caught me. The plane dive-bombing, representing Pink's father's death. Then we hear a bomb drop, and the bomb doesn't detonate. Instead, it's a baby crying. I think this is a way to represent, you know, the stork dropping baby Pink after his father's death. I haven't heard anybody else making a point of Pink admitting to beating his wife on Don't Leave Me Now. Though we don't get another dial tone, I interpret this song as Pink calling up his wife, drunk or high, and begging her to stay so he can punish her for cheating. There is just a wealth of material to analyze here, and I'm not even scratching the surface. Raj is quite suited to the theatrical to begin with. Uh, big personalities generally are. Here he's gone totally reckless abandon, adopting other voices for characters like the schoolmaster. He pushes his voice as hard as it could go. That sustained note at the end of one of my turns is a standout moment not enough people talk about. We have the ghostly howls through the Another Brick in the Wall Part 1 refrain, the wounded animal performance of Another Brick in the Wall Part 3, and of course, his signature inhale scream. Considering everything else he did for this thing, Roger kind of gets off the hook as far as being a bassist goes. Even Production plays a role in telling the story of the wall. There are these small touches to keep the atmosphere. When you want a rock opera, right, you want something that is just gonna suck you into the world of the album, and Roger, the rest of Floyd production, they all united to do just that on the wall. Check out when the bass sort of trickles down on the thin ice, or 
on Empty Spaces. Both are weird favorites of mine on this album for the atmosphere they give. Mixing the baby cooing with David's voice on the thin ice. The schoolmaster screaming through a bullhorn from a helicopter on Happiest Days of Our Lives. That is just bonkers. And the oof hidden in there. That's just funny. The backwards message on Empty Spaces. It's a much needed palate cleanser to kind of take the piss out of the listener. Where production and the musicians really unite. Where they really drive this thing home is when they use guitar and bass as synths. But you also don't want to be, like, totally out of your depth, right? You want to be able to still have a little bit of fun. Roger did a good job at balancing the more radio-friendly cuts, like Comfortably Numb, Young Lust, even Goodbye Blue Sky could stand alone outside of the wall's narrative, with the more theatrical moments, like Another Brick in the Wall, which oddly enough, was the big radio hit of the wall, or Hey You. The most theatrical we get is The Trial. It is just f***ing insane. And it's fun. In some perverted way, it's fun. It's all constructed with great intent. This thing is 80 minutes long, but it's 80 minutes long for a reason. The music is immersive enough. The narrative is clear enough, all leading up to Pink Spiral and Sent into madness. It feels so dark. Another Brick in the Wall and Young Lust are the most fun cuts here, but even those have this dark cloud hanging over them. Where Floyd shines as a whole on the wall is continuing to flesh out the story through cues in the music. The wall is really masterfully composed. From the interlude passages serving as time skips to recurring motifs in solos, uh, this narrative is told not just through Roger's lyrics, but through Floyd's music. Of course, the Comfortably Numb solo is one of David's all-time best. It's second only to time in my eyes. That is just a perfectly constructed solo. You want an even better Comfortably Numb? Listen to it live on Pulse. David just goes off on that thing. I love that he worked a little more grit into his sound with the wall. He got a little more comfortable with doing that through animals, giving credit where credit is due. On the spectrum of rigid versus fluid that all guitarists exist on, David is all the way on the end of fluid. So to hear him get a little more aggressive on In the Flesh, Hey You, The Trial, or one of the most underrated solos of his career, The Thin Ice, uh, it's refreshing. I've said it before and I'll say it again, Rick Wright was the MVP of Floyd. Part of why In the Flesh is such a good statement of intent for the wall is because of his organ flourishes deep in the mix. He's always been essential to Floyd's atmosphere. Atmosphere is what makes Floyd Floyd. Rick only gets one 30-second solo on all 80 minutes of this album, but he makes his presence known. Run Like Hell is one of my favorite tracks for that solo. It reminds me of something Rush might have done on Signals, and hold the f*** up. I've been doing this for three seasons. I'm on my third year of this sh and I haven't covered Rush at all? Major oversight on my part. Oh my god. Uh, it's a shame Rick didn't get more of the spotlight because his work was so essential. It is essential to the mood of the wall. You have those drones hanging low in almost every song, making everything feel ominous. Raj even targeted Rick through the mix of this album by mixing all of Rick's stuff so low. As for Nick, the wall was such a different way for Floyd to be recording their drums. We're pushing the mics back farther and farther. It's very 80s. It's one of the things that I'm just not crazy about when it comes to 80s production. That does give us our really bombastic moments, but uh, why does stuff like Run Like Hell 
comfortably numb, even the emotional incest song Mother. Why do those pique my interest? because they've pulled Nick's mics forward. Going through the songs cut from the album but featured in the film, I don't really long for any of them here. It would have messed with the pacing, and pacing is so important when you're writing a rock opera. And finally, The Wall is a better rock opera than Tommy and I will die on this hill. Why? Because The Wall's plot, for the most part, is clear. It's a hell of a lot more concise than Tommy. And these characters have unique voices and personalities within the narrative. Tommy doesn't really have this. I think The Wall is such a vast improvement on the rock opera in general because, well, the rock opera had only been around for about two years when Tommy was made. It was around for about 12 by the time we get to The Wall. Even after all of this, I still have not even scratched the surface of the wall, and that's the beauty of this mammoth. At a first glance, it's this monolithic thing, seemingly infinite bricks mortared into place. It's been here long before you, and it's gonna be here after you. But look closer, and you'll see it's sentient. It's moving, breathing, and changing as the years go on. Is it self-indulgent at times? Yes, it can be tiring to listen to a horse man sing about dead dad for almost an hour and a half. Trust me, I did that many, many times for this video. This is a blank white wall, so objective at first, but that makes it a blank canvas for you to paint your own life experiences on. That's how the wall keeps changing after so many years. The wall is intimidating as hell. I get it. But if you take the time to chip away at it yourself, you'll find it so rewarding. My personal favorites are In the Flesh, The Thin Ice, Hey You, Nobody Home, Run Like Hell, and The Trial, and my favorite three-song run, the one that I just can't dream of breaking apart, is Vera, Bring the Boys Back Home, and Comfortably Numb. If you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all of the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. Oh, and that is it. That is The Wall by Pink Floyd. By the time you see this, I will be in a car on my way to see Slow Dive. I am so excited to see them all performing songs that I love, but I'm especially excited to see Neil Halstead. <laughs> so leave me a bunch of comments for when I get home. What do you think of The Wall? What do you think of Pink Floyd? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums I love. And if you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye!